Guten Tag. That is the total extent of all German that I know, so I'm going to move to English now. Um, I'm delighted to be here. This is a very exciting time to be a digital business leader, or for that matter, any leader in business, because it appears that the technology likely to have the greatest impact on the world of business and arguably the world at large has arrived. But it's not mobility, big data, the social web, cloud computing, or any of these other technologies. It's actually the technology behind cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, and it's called blockchain. So just a show of hands, who here has heard of this blockchain before? And who of you thinks you understand it really well? Okay, there's, there's one in the back. Maybe does she want to give the talk? No. Um, so that's very interesting. Um, it's my hope that at the end of this talk, you'll, you'll reflect back on, on what you heard today in the same way that you might reflect on a talk you heard 25 years ago about the internet. Because blockchain technology represents nothing short of the second generation of the internet and is foundational to the fourth industrial revolution. So when you use the internet today to send and move and share information, you're not actually sending an original, you're sending a copy. And generally speaking, for most kinds of information, that's okay. In fact, it's one of the big benefits of the internet. So if you send an email to one person, you can send it to many. If you host a website, anybody can access it. So it's like having a printing press for information, and that's a very powerful tool. Except when it comes to things that have value, like, say, money, being able to send a copy is a really bad idea. If I pay 20 euros to Ingo for something, it's very important that he knows that he has it, and I don't still have the same $20. Because if I could send the same $20 to every single person in this room, that $20 would be worthless. So it's good to have a printing press for information. It's not so good to have a printing press for money, or for anything that has value, for that matter. And this is a specific problem that computer scientists have been trying to resolve for the better part of 20 years. It's called the double spend problem. How do you make sure that when you move something that has value, an asset, over the internet, that you're not leaving behind a digital trail of breadcrumbs? And it turns out that that's a very difficult problem to solve. So as a result, we still rely on middlemen, intermediaries, to sit in the middle and perform essential roles. They identify the parties in a transaction, they create trust between those parties, and they perform all the business logic, the clearing, the settling of transactions, and record keeping. And generally speaking, they do a pretty good job, but they have very specific limitations. The first is that they're all centralized. And anything that's centralized is vulnerable to hacking or to attack or to outright failure. And this is true in basically every single industry. The second problem is that they slow things down and they add cost and friction. Take, for example, cross-border payments. It can take up to five to seven days and cost up to 10% just to move money across borders, which is odd. When was the last time anyone in this room sent a cross-border email? It doesn't exist. It happens instantly. So certain kinds of information happen instantly, but others take a lot of time and cost a lot of money. The fourth reason is that they exclude big parts of the population. You know, there are two and a half billion people in the world who don't have access to basic financial services. Now, there are a few reasons for that. One is that they don't have a lot of money, which makes them uh, unpopular to banks as customers. But the other big reason, they don't have an identity. They don't have a way to prove who they are. And as a result, Firms can't perform what's called KYC, know your customer, and therefore can't bring them into the global economy. Uh, the fourth and final, the fifth reason rather, is that they capture data, which can be problematic. It means that we can't use that data to organize our affairs, but it could also undermine our privacy. So you can argue in some that intermediaries capture an asymmetric benefit from the gener first generation of the internet, perhaps even more than in the pre-digital age, in a funny way, which is what was not supposed to happen, but it ended up happening that way. So what if the internet was entering a second era, from an internet of information to an internet of value, based on a vast new global platform that at its essence was what's called a distributed ledger, essentially a huge global spreadsheet of all transactions that have ever happened and are currently happening. But unlike most ledgers, it wouldn't run on one computer like inside of a bank. It would run on many computers, perhaps all computers. And it wouldn't be accessible to a few, it would be accessible to all. 
And on this platform, not just information like emails and PDFs and websites, but literally anything that has value, money, financial assets like stocks and bonds, titles and deeds to property, votes in an election, IP like music, art, and film, could be moved, stored, and managed securely and privately, and where trust was not established by a third party like a bank, but through mass collaboration, consensus, cryptography, and clever code. So we heard that blockchain had its origins with uh, Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency that's used by uh, drug dealers and all the other uh, nasty sorts. Um, Bitcoin has an interesting history. You know, it was designed as to be basically cash for the internet, a bare instrument that would allow you to make payments peer to peer. Like if I were to go out and buy uh, you know, a, a pretzel or a strudel and I hand the, uh, the guy five euro note, that's not settling through Visa, it's not using PayPal, there's no bank, it's a bare instrument, it happens peer to peer. So this was designed as basically cash for the internet. And what was fascinating about Bitcoin is that it worked. And it worked so well that it set off a spark which has caught on like wildfire and captured the imagination of people far outside of the world of payments or even financial services to basically business leaders in every single industry. So how does all this stuff work? It starts with, as I described, a distributed ledger running on many different computers. Transactions are constantly happening on the network, and every so often, like the heartbeat of that network, they're bundled into this thing called a block. That block is then broadcast to all the participants on the network. Certain participants commit large computing resources to work together to achieve consensus on what is true, what transactions actually happened. Did I actually send that $20 to Ingo and did he receive it? Did that vote in that election actually get cast for the right person? Did the sale of that financial asset actually occur? And in reward for achieving consensus, uh, they are awarded in some form. In the Bitcoin network, they're awarded with new Bitcoin, but Bitcoin's one of many different blockchains with different incentive mechanisms. Once that block is established, it is added to a chain of blocks, hence the blockchain. All the information in each block must refer to the information in the preceding block, which must refer to the information in the preceding block all the way back to the beginning of time. This is the big innovation, uh, because what it means, in essence, is that if you wanted to hack the system, it wouldn't be as easy as getting through a firewall in a centralized company and moving a number in a database. You'd actually have to hack every single computer on the network simultaneously, do it in a very short period of time, fighting against a computing resource which is bigger than any that's ever been marshaled in human history. Uh, by some estimates, the Bitcoin network is 10 to 100 times as powerful as all of Google's server farms put together. So is it unhackable? No. If I say it's unhackable today, it'll get hacked tomorrow. That's just the way this stuff works. But it is a significantly better system than any we've ever devised to move and store and manage anything of value. And that is the important innovation. And Bitcoin is really just the start. Who here has heard of Ethereum? Oh, you Germans are on top of the case. Holy moly. Uh, I was in uh, Vegas the other day, and it was like 10%. So Ethereum, another blockchain with a, with a cool uh, origin story. It was started by a 19-year-old uh, college dropout who hosted a little crowdfunding campaign and raised $20 million to get this going. Uh, <laughs> They, they helped to pioneer an innovation called smart contracts, which are basically what they sound like, software that mimics the logic of a contract, but with guaranteed execution, enforcement, and payments, and where you don't need to rely on traditional parties like lawyers, bankers, courts, escrow agents, and other intermediaries. And if you think about business logic in any business for any company or any organization, contracting is fundamental to all of it. Another one is called Hyperledger, which is an innovation that was spearheaded by the Linux Foundation with the support of IBM and many other companies. Uh, they now count, uh, in terms of members, over 100 uh, major corporations, governments, and other significant institutions. So in the book, Blockchain Revolution, we identified some of the big transitions and potential impact that this technology could have. And one was on this idea of creating a more fair and prosperous world. And indeed, there are many examples of how this could happen. Everything from bringing billions of people into the economy to improving the way we record ownership of things like land and property. You know, there's a famous economist, his name is Hernando de Soto, and he argues 
that 70% of people in the developing world who think they own land actually have an unenforceable claim to that property, either because there's a duplicate claim, because there's a missing record, because there's a corrupt government official who's not willing to recognize it, or because there's a conspiracy at the highest levels to expropriate land from people. And a house is obviously more than just the roof over your head. It's also a source of income. It can also be a way to access credit to pay for an education or start a business. So without clear property rights, no one will actually ever be upwardly mobile. So this could help to solve that problem. Financial services is another area that I think in five to 10 years will be completely unrecognizable. And this is one of the areas where blockchain's been um, very impactful early on. My focus, however, today is on what blockchain means for business and for the enterprise. Because this is much more than just a technology that will impact an industry. It's not FinTech. This is a technology that will transform every industry. So this is a, a world-famous economist who won a Nobel Prize. His name is uh, Ronald Coase. And uh, among other things, I'd like to know what he had for breakfast, because he lived till he was 103. Um, but Ronald Coase asked a deceptively simple question in a paper called The Theory of the Firm. He asked, why do we have companies? If the best way to organize capability and allocate resources in an economy is using the open market, how come everyone's not an independent contractor? How come sales, manufacturing, supply chain, management, uh, logistic, H HR, et cetera, aren't bidding with each other to find the best price? And he pointed to one thing, and for doing so, he won a Nobel Prize. He said transaction costs. So long as it's cheaper to do something inside the boundaries of the firm than in an open market, companies will continue to grow. So in the early days of capitalism, Henry Ford and the early industrialists kind of understood this, which is why the Ford Motor Company didn't just make cars. They also had a, a steel plant, a um, timber mill, a rubber plantation in Brazil. Everything was inside of the firm in a hierarchical, vertically integrated uh, form. And that was kind of the way companies operated for many years. The first wave of the digital age helped to unbundle the firm, so the cost of search, the cost of communication, the cost of collaboration dropped. So all of a sudden, the mantra in the 90s was, focus on what you do best, outsource the rest. And that eventually led to new models of partnerships where the four walls of the firm didn't have to contain necessarily all the capability. You could partner with other companies uh, who did things differently and did things better to confer competitive advantage. But if you look at the company today, pick any company, does it really look that much different than it did 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 50 years ago? Certain things have certainly changed, but the architecture of the firm is pretty similar. And I think that there's one specific reason for that, which is that the internet, the first generation of the internet, dropped those costs of search and communication, but it did very little to impact the real hard costs of why we have firms. The cost of contracting, the cost of negotiating and enforcing contracts, and the cost of establishing trust in a marketplace. Those costs remain very high, and so it still made sense to keep things inside the boundaries of the firm. So what does it mean for new business models for the company as a whole in any industry when those transaction costs drop in the same way that the internet dropped the cost of, say, search or communication. We think it creates or enables seven new kinds of business models. So we know about uh, Uber, you know, the sharing economy, Airbnb, uh, Didi, um, you know, Lyft, these other companies. And it's a nice notion that you know, they're sharing economy models that we all get together and we share in the value that's created. But it's a bit of a misnomer. In fact, these companies are not successful because they share. They're successful because they don't share. They aggregate. They aggregate excess capacity through a very centralized model. In fact, the, the whole model relies basically on becoming a monopoly. And then they resell that into a willing marketplace. In the process, they capture a lot of the value. They take 20%, sure, and that might not seem like a lot, but the $65 billion that Uber's worth is not shared by those who create value or those who use the service, it's aggregated. So what does Uber really do? I think broadly speaking, it does four things. The first thing it does is identity. You log on to Uber, you see the name of the driver, where he is, what kind of car he's got, and he sees similar information about you. The second thing is reputation. You look at his uh, rating, he's got a 4 out of 5 or a 4.5 out of 5 star rating. You might also have a similar rating, which connects you to uh, based on that information. 
The third thing is contracting. You don't really notice this, but when you enter into an Uber, you're actually entering into a little contract that Uber is enforcing. So if you get taken to where you want to go, you pay. If the guy runs out of gas or gets in an accident, which actually happened with me once, um, or let's say he cancels the fare, you don't pay. So there's a contract that's being enforced by Uber. And the fourth thing is payments, integrated under the back end, Visa, PayPal, and others. How can blockchain change that, those aspects? Well, identity and reputation could be more accurate and more robust if it's based on information that everyone can know is true and that we can trust. And sharing economy companies know this, which is why Airbnb recently bought a blockchain developer. Um, contracting, well, you could use smart contracting, basically software, to execute based on a set of conditions that I just described. And payments, blockchain technology is a native payment system built into the back end. So all of a sudden, you might be able to do everything the sharing economy companies do, but without the company in the middle. And there's an IoT implementation here as well with self-driving cars. So an autonomous vehicle might not just drive itself, it might also pay for its own fuel, contract with fares, uh, negotiate liability in the case of a crash, buy its own insurance, um, do everything maybe except go to court. Creative industries is another area where blockchain is having a big impact. Uh, the music industry really hit its stride in, in the mid-20th uh, century. And it was never really fair to artists, but artists were able to at least extract some value. So you'd sign with a label and you'd receive royalty payments of, say, 5% or 10%, maybe 20% if you were Frank Sinatra, but nothing more than that. The internet came along and it was supposed to fix this problem by disintermediating the labels and allowing uh, creators to, to uh, interact directly with their fans. Except the only problem was that the internet took something that was an asset and turned it into a free commodity that could be pumped through the printing press of the internet over and over again, and its value basically dropped to zero. So a new set of intermediaries stepped in, Apple, Music, Spotify, et cetera, and the streaming model um, really hit its stride actually this year. Uh, for the first time ever, streaming revenue outpaced revenue from physical sales. Except the streaming model is bad for artists. In the 80s, if you wrote a hit song and it sold a million copies, you'd make $45,000. Today, that same song streams a million times on Spotify. You don't make 45 grand. You make 36 bucks, which in Munich does not go very far, uh, or any city for that matter. So uh, a whole bunch of cool new entrepreneurs have stepped up to try and solve this problem. One is Imogen Heap. She's a Grammy Award-winning singer-songwriter. She's created this platform called Mycelia, and basically, she's recognized, along with a few others, that songs are already digital, you know? Songs already have information about who performed them, arts, lyrics, etc. Why couldn't they also have smart contracting language built into them that identified, specified clearly who owned what royalties? So the songwriter owns 10%, the lead singer owns 20, the label owns 20, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then licensing rules that said if you buy it, it costs a dollar, if you stream it, it costs a penny, if you sample it, it costs X, if you use it in film or TV, it costs something else. And every time that song is consumed, regardless of where it's consumed, if it's consumed on YouTube or Spotify, Apple Music, if it's sold peer-to-peer, -peer, if it's played on the radio, it executes a contract that ensures that creators get paid first and that they get paid fairly. And this model can apply to other types of businesses that are non-creative, something like, say, um, the Linux kernel, or Wikipedia for that matter. Wikipedia is one of the amazing resources that's been created in the history of humanity, but it's, under, it's in trouble because it's got no money. So what if people who made entries into Wikipedia that were adopted and recognized as being accurate could receive a payment, a very small fractional payment? And what if when you logged into Wikipedia, you paid a tenth of a penny or a fifth of a penny, and by the end of the, the, end of the year it cost you three or four bucks? You'd probably do that in exchange for this accurate resource. There's an assumption that blockchain's a big disintermediator, that it's gonna put banks out of business. And to be sure, there are many use cases and instances where if you're a bank or any financial intermediary, and all you do is process a payment, and, you've, and you're making money on that because you've always made money on it, and you've defended that position, then you're probably in trouble. And that's certainly true of something like the remittance market. However, if you sit in the middle and you add value, if you use a new technology to offer new services and products that you couldn't before, 
and you're servicing your customer better, then there's actually a big opportunity for you. So remittances are the largest flow of funds into the developing world. $600 billion flows every year from the developed world into the developing world. The average fees, according to the World Bank, are 10%. $60 billion of fees are being paid by people who really shouldn't be paying them. And that money is coming out of the pockets of people who actually need this the most. So enter companies like Abra and others like it. So Abra is a company that's enabled peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments using the Bitcoin network. So you log on to Abra, you see um, the local currency, euros, you want to send f uh, money to your family in Turkey, uh, you can. Um, it converts instantly into Bitcoin, then converts on the back end into Turkish lira. The transaction costs 25 basis points, it does not cost 10%, and it takes 10 minutes and it doesn't take 10 days. So this is a 10x improvement. Now, Abra is uh, uh, one that we know very well, and we actually used um, the service ourselves to send money to the Philippines, but there are many other companies like this uh, that are trying to break into this market. So this is an example of re-intermediation. So $300 billion a year of supply chain fraud happens in the global economy. It can be everything from counterfeiting to uh, goods not being delivered, to um, tariffs being circumvented at ports, points of entry. And this is a problem for the economy, and it's certainly a problem for huge, massive, uh, integrated conglomerates like Siemens, who have this complex supply chains. So what if you could know with 100% certainty the provenance, the origin of the goods that were in the supply chain, and you could track them over time at every single uh, point of entry that they went into? You could know, for example, with food, right down to the cow, what was in your burger. Now, you may not want to know that. <laughs> Makes it a bit too personal. Um, but if it's, say, milk that you're feeding to your baby from China, you might want to know that there's not lead paint in it. And something like this can apply to lots of other assets. So Everledger is a company that does this with diamonds. And this is another in uh, Internet of Things implementation, actually. So what they do is they do a multi-factor authentication on the diamonds. So they look at the cut, the clarity, the size, they look at the um, location of all of the faults in the diamonds, and they create a picture of this diamond, which they then hash and create a digital version of it. And you can track that diamond at every point through the supply chain. And they've already put two million diamonds on this network. So when you buy your diamond ring for your sweetheart, your fiance, you can know with certainty that it didn't come from a blood diamond region. It came from one that's part of the, the Kimberley Project, which uh, regulates these kinds of things. So in many respects, you can argue that the blockchain is the new supply chain. So the Internet of Things is something that continues to come up, and it's an area that's obviously very important to many of you in this room. Um, you know, this basically describes a world where there are tens of billions, maybe hundreds of billions, maybe trillions of Internet-enabled devices doing everything from driving us around to monitoring our health to powering our homes to managing our affairs. And these devices, will be communicating with each other. And they won't just be communicating information, they'll be communicating value. And there's some information that isn't monetary, but is still valuable, like your personal health records, for example. So you need a way, a, digital, a native digital medium, to communicate value that you can trust to secure. And there's practical limitations to the Internet of Things today. You know, if you have a light bulb in your house that's metering power from your neighbor's solar panel, at, say, a penny a day, that can't settle and clear on the Visa network. It's too small. So these micropayments need a new way of communicating value. So the old model for power generation was a centralized, top-down industrial model. Uh, you'd have a, a large coal-fired power plant, natural gas-fired power plant, what have you, that would generate electricity and sell it to a market, usually through a regulated utility. And it's a model that worked for the industrial age because you needed economies of scale to make it happen. But it wasn't the, mo that most, the most efficient, not just because it was burning coal or some other fossil fuel, but because a lot of power is actually lost in transmission from the point of where it's created to where it's consumed. Just, that's just physics. So what role can blockchain play? Well, there are three big innovations happening today. Number one, the cost and the efficiency of, uh, of solar panels is, is improving and dropping. So the, the cost is, is dropping and the productivity is improving. Battery power has made a lot of great leaps forward as well. And the third thing is blockchain. So now there are groups like the Brooklyn Microgrid, developed by a company called LO3, and other forms of um, distributed power generation systems, which you'll hear from um, 
one of my co-speakers later on today, that are looking for ways to distribute power generation and create marketplaces. So with these guys, with the Brooklyn microgrid, you generate power, it gets bundled, you take the, the actual kilojoules, the energy itself, bundle it into a digital asset, which you can then sell peer-to-peer -peer in an open marketplace, not back into the grid at a wholesale rate. So this improves the resilience of the grid because it makes it distributed, and also improves the efficiency, and it could actually empower individuals to make money off the power that they create. So this is what's called a Rube Goldberg machine. I don't know if you have these in Germany. It's uh, developed by an American satirist. And a Rube Goldberg machine is basically a very complicated contraption that does a whole bunch of really unnecessary steps, and in the end, it solves a very simple problem. This is basically the way the financial services industry works. <laughs> in many ways, you know, you go to, go to a coffee shop and you tap your card on the card reader, and you think maybe there's a, uh, you know, an instant payment that's happening to the merchant, but that's not what's happening. That, value is going through a series of different intermediaries, sometimes up to five, different banks, payment processors, risk managers, etc. And it can take three to four days to settle. And it can cost two to three percent. For a lot of online merchants, the interchange fees can actually be five to ten percent. So that's a very simple thing. You're making a payment. Why does it have to cost so much? There are lots of examples like that in the industry. And you know, you can look at all of these different components as ones that could be disrupted. Just briefly on one, so insurance. So insurance and the Internet of Things are going to converge together. Let's imagine for a second that you've got a vehicle and another driver has a vehicle and you get into an accident. And you have sensors on that vehicle which can identify where the damage happens. Because, the inter because both cars are Internet enabled, they're able to communicate with each other and discover each other's insurance plans. And based on the assessment of the damage, they can execute a payment that happens instantly between the two insurers. And there are many different examples like that in the industry. The final thing is data. So a funny thing has happened during the first generation of the Internet, which is the creation of this whole new asset class called data. And what's funny about this asset class is that we all create it, but we don't own it. It's owned by your bank, your government, Facebook, Google, Apple, Uber, et cetera. And the weird thing is, is there's a virtual you out there. And the virtual you knows you better than you know you. You don't know necessarily what exactly you said, where exactly you went, what you bought, and for how much exactly to this day one year ago. But the virtual you does, and it knows a lot more. And that's problematic, because it means we can't use that information to organize our life better, but it also means it could undermine our privacy, intentionally or not. Unten unintentionally because it gets hacked, intentionally because it ends up in the wrong hands. So what if the virtual you could be controlled by you? Where if you entered into a transaction, say for, with a retailer, that retailer doesn't necessarily need to know who you are. They only need to know that you have the money. But you want to go to a bank and get a loan, they're going to need more information. And you can provide that and much more than what they get today. But the important thing is that you're doing so with informed consent. It's your decision to make. So you might think this is the end of big data. It's not. It's actually a different kind of big data. It's big data, but it's small data. And it could be better data. But it requires companies to engage with their customers as peers, not looking at them as a number on a spreadsheet. So that's seven business models and how they will be transformed, which is one chapter. I'd like to end on this because it's topical. So since the financial crisis of 2008, legitimacy, or I should say confidence, in many of our institutions has been in decline. In banks, in the financial services industry, in companies writ large, even in governments, even in some of the big institutions of our society like capitalism and democracy. And we're seeing the rise of populism, anti-globalists, etc., in many different parts of the world. And there's good reason for this, I think, actually, in many places. So in the United States, a lot of people feel like governments don't represent their interests. Well, in a system where a private citizen or corporation can donate unlimited amounts to a campaign, they've got good reason to be concerned. So governments are not beholden to citizens, they're beholden to special interests. So what role could blockchain play? Well, there are lots of different ways. I want to focus on one specific thing, which is central banking. So one of the big surprises from the past year, at least for me, has been the rise of central banks as a driving force of innovation uh, in this sector. We've seen the Bank of Canada, Federal Reserve, 
um, the People's Bank of China, and especially the Bank of England, stepping up. So the Bank of England basically argued that by just moving 30% of pound-denominated transactions onto a native digital medium, both in physical notes and also that happen electronically, you can improve the GDP of the country by 3% permanently, which in this low-growth environment is tremendous. Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, made, took, went so far as to say in his Mansion House speech, which is the most important one of the year, that blockchain was one of the two key innovations that was going to transform the economy of the UK and the world. So what does it mean for central banks? Well, the first one, simply put, is by reducing the friction and costs in the system, everything from real-time settlement of financial trades and stocks and bonds to instantaneous payments and retail locations, if that all happened instantaneously using a native digital currency, then it would reduce costs and reduce friction, uh, which would obviously boost GDP. That's kind of low-hanging fruit. The second big thing is by reducing the cost structure and making it easier for new entrants to play in the economy, you could actually solve one of these big problems, which is the lack of financial and economic inclusion, which you might think is a developing world problem, but still exists in a lot of parts of the developed world. You know, in the United States, only 85% of people are banked. Put another way, there are 45 million adults in the US who don't have a bank account. So that's a big problem, and it keeps those people permanently um, in, lower, in the lower class. And the third thing is just simply put, if you had greater transparency and greater assurance of the quality of financial information in the system, you might be able to identify crises before they happen. And at the very least, greater transparency at the central bank level would improve confidence in that institution, which today, everything from the ECB to the Fed and others, is currently under attack. So those are a few transformations and there are many reasons why blockchain could be transformative, but there are also many reasons why it might not reach its potential. They range from technical issues. Can we scale this to meet the demands of an Internet of Things where trillions of devices are making transactions on a daily basis? This is a question that remains unresolved. Can we get regulators and governments to create policies that help to support innovation but also protect consumers, that don't stifle it but also don't um, undermine confidence. What happens if blockchain's a job killer? How do we respond when criminals use this technology? These are big problems, big questions that need answering. But you have to ask yourself, are they reasons that blockchain's a bad idea? Or are they implementation challenges to be overcome? And in each case, we believe that they're implementation challenges. And we must overcome them because the opportunity is significant. So this is a paradigm shift. And when paradigms change, leaders of the old oftentimes, oftentimes have a hard time embracing the new. You know, there's a reason that Blockbuster did not invent Netflix, why Marriott did not create Airbnb. CNN could have built Twitter. I mean, it's the ultimate soundbite machine. It should have been right in their wheelhouse. But they didn't. The things that make incumbents strong in normal times make it a liability in times of disruption. So it appears that once again, the technology genie has been unleashed from the bottle. Summoned by an unknown person or persons at an uncertain time in history, this genie is once again at our disposal to transform the economic power grid and the old order of human affairs for the better, but only if we will it. So please, join us. Thank you. <laughs>